the, the outline of today. Um, so hopefully I'll, I'll make it to the end. Uh, so I'll start with a short reminders of what we're trying, to, what we need to prove, and then I'll talk about two partial orders. On this is just uh, so this is the finitely generated or finite rank finite rank subgroups of of the free group on K generators. Okay, so FG means fin finitely generator, finitely generated. Uh, so we'll see two partial orders, one. Uh, defined by algebraic extensions of free groups, and then one by core graphs, which I will I will explain, and then uh, I will I will generalize um, the notion of the number of fixed points of a random of a random permutation generated by a word to the number of fixed points uh, that correspond to subgroups, and then I'll, I'll talk about maybe some versions of this function, and then more details. Um, okay, so I'll start with the reminders. So first of all, so you remember in, in a free group, a primitive word, a, a, an element is called primitive if it belongs to a basis, okay, a free generating set. And we had two different, we had the definition of uh, the primitivity rank. Primitivity rank of an element of the free group is uh, denoted by pi of w, and this is, so we go over, we go over all the subgroup of, of the free group of fk, which contain w, but such that w is not primitive in age, and then we wanted to see, we, we, we checked which age was the uh, minimal, in terms of rank, in terms of the number of generators. And, um, and, and we called the critical subgroups of, of W, this is the set of such A's, the, the set of such minimal ages. And the theorem that I want to prove today, which is joined with Oleg Pozenchevsky, is that um, if I look at a random permutation generated by my word, by a word W, and I count the number of fixed points, in this random permutation, then the average is given by one plus uh, something of order of magnitude of one over n to the primitivity rank minus one. And here I have the critical subgroups, the number of critical subgroups, and then uh, stuff of a uh, smaller order. Okay, so this is the this is the theorem that I want to prove today. <clears throat> okay, so we'll start with uh, so two partial orders. Uh, now I want to go to to, to uh, define two partial orders on the set of finitely generated subgroups of the free group, and I'll start with algebraic extensions. So we'll give some definitions. Okay, so let A, H and J be free group. So we say that H, sorry, that J is a free extension. age if and we, and we, we denote by okay because this is because uh, uh, we also say in this case that age is a free factor of J if um, 
um, sum or every basis basis of age uh, can be can be extended to a basis of j extended to a basis of j Right. right. So this should be the number of critical subjects should be zero. Right. And, and in, uh, this means that uh, there's no. Yeah. So so for I remind you for primitive words. Primitive so this will be yeah there will be no critical. Subjects. Yeah. For pr primitive words there are no there are no such primitive words are primitive in every subgroup. Yeah. So there are no such age that we define the primitivity rank to be infinity, and the critical subgroup is uh, is an empty. It's an empty uh, set. That's what the denominator means. It's anyway, it's zero. So because it's zero by okay. Yeah. So this is infinity and this is a zero. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Um <coughs> I want you to take it from a critical omega. Is it minimal age which is one or it means roughly one or two minutes? Or a number. Uh, no, so so this is the se this is the set, and this is just the, here I take the, the number. Ah, so so there are uh, certain subgroups w which show me where W is not primitive, and they, they are of minimal rank. So these are the 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 subgroups of minimal rank, the one that shows those that show me the primitivity rank, those that manifest the primitivity primitivity rank. Uh, yeah, uh, asymptotically, yes, yes, yeah. For every word, when n is n is growing, the number fixed point is at least one. Yeah, and I forget forgot to check uh, Albert's paper to see what is the exact uh, press in the break. I'll check. Um, yeah, okay, and uh, you will soon s I will soon give another interpretation of the of the theorem in terms of algebra. Algebraic extensions. Okay, so so a free extension means that I just it means that I have a J is a, a free group, so I have some basis, and I, I just take a part of the basis, and I get age. Okay, so in some sense this is a a boring extension. Nothing hap Nothing interesting happens there. And uh, and again, so we said that uh, uh, J is a free extension of age, or age is a free factor of of uh, J, and to the contrary, um, uh, we say that a j is an algebraic extension of age, and we denote it by alg like that. Um, if uh, there is no there is no intermediate intermediate free factor. Okay, so there is mean there is no L such that L sits between H and J, and L is a proper proper L is a proper free factor. Of J. Um, <clears throat> okay, and here is a something, uh, and it's an it's effect. It's, it's again, it's an easy effect, so I will not prove it because we don't need it. But it is it can be proven in a, in the same way we pro we prove that, for example, every primitive element is primitive in every subgroup. It's the same kind of proof that shows you that. Uh, for every that that whenever we have free, two free groups A and J, there is a unique uh, the composition of this extension to an algebraic part and free part. Okay, so fact uh, these are free groups, so there is a unique uh, the composition of this extension to 
an algebraic part, and a free part. Okay, so there's the S. Um, sorry? No, no, unique. Yeah, you, you actually you just take the, to <coughs> you just take the, 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 for example, the intersection of all three factors, all intermediate three factors in J, you take the intersection, you get this, and then it's easy to see that. Um, I mean, oh, do you mean the free factor uh, subgroups? Free factor, I mean, it's easy to see the f intersection of two free factors is a free factor. Um, yeah, this is not, yeah. This is, this is what you, to show this, you do the same as, as with the, uh, and, um, Yes, yeah, so this is a, a so this is actually, uh, what I would say is that this, uh, this order is a partial, this is a partial order. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it's not hard, um, so I will, Okay, so what do we need to, to see is a partial order? So, okay, ref reflexive is, is obvious, okay? A group is, a, is a, an algebraic itself, itself because there are no proper uh, subgroups in between. Um, okay, anti-symmetric is also obvious because uh, it's a suborder of the regular order, of the subgroup order. And so the transitive is really what, is really the interesting part. Transitive. Um, so th this is a bit harder, but um, yeah, I don't think I. It's, it's also quite easy. I, I would, if I have time at the end, I will. Okay, it's not. Uh, I mean, if you want to sh see it, I can show it. But um, I think we we have some small explanations in in our paper. And there is a, and we also have reference. So there is a, there is a big, there is a big, like a survey about algebraic extensions by um, uh, Miasnikov, Ventura, and uh, I think Weil, Pascal Way. So perhaps I'll show it afterwards. I mean, it's not hard. Um, <clears throat> ah, okay. And now, what, what is the re what is the relation between algebraic extensions and and uh, this theorem? So the claim is that um, uh, if H is a critical subgroup of W, then H is an al algebraic extension of the subgroup generated by W. A end of minimal rank. Okay, so perhaps I'll write it differently. Uh, so H, actually this is if and only if, H is a, a proper algebraic extension of W of minimal rank. Okay, and, and, and why is that? This is because, um, okay, so if, um, so assume from right to left, From right to left, if, if it's a minimal. It's of minimal rank, and you cannot complete W to the basis of it. Right. 
No, so this means that W is not primitive. It's not primitive, but why does it mean that it's not, it is, it is of minimal... Uh, Yeah, no, okay, but you first need, I think you need to prove first that uh, per perhaps there are uh, other groups that are not algebraic uh, extensions. So I think you need to prove the left to right, and then it's easier to see the. Okay, so, so assume H is a critical subgroup. So, and, um, but if, if we have this, a uh, proper free factor. Uh, so age was so age L is of smaller rank than age, and age was minimal, right? In, in the, among the groups where W is not primitive, so it means that that uh, W is primitive in L. So it's part of a basis of L, but then you can extend the basis to a basis of age, and then it's uh, so this is uh, impossible. So um, so you get that age is indeed a, an algebraic extension of W, and a, a proper one, right, because uh, otherwise, I mean, W is primitive in the subgroup, in this subgroup, W. Um, and, and, and then, okay, and now you can say what, now we can say what you said, that if uh, age is a proper algebraic extension, okay, now we need, if H is a proper, if, if it's an algebraic extension, uh, then W cannot be primitive there. So all the algebraic extensions are in this set. All the proper algebraic extensions are, are here. And then, uh, but only, the, only they are, only algebraic extensions can be critical. So obviously, you need to take those of minimal rank. And yeah, yeah, both are there, yeah. Yeah, this is still the easy. Okay, so now we can. So we disclaim what we actually show. So now I'm going to give a reinterpretation of the theorem. What we actually show is that this expected number of fixed points of the random permutation is actually equal to one. Plus now what we do is go over all um, algebraic extensions of W. And show that for each, each algebraic extension contributes uh, one divided by n to the rank of H minus one. and then smaller stuff. Yes. Um, it's, it's actually, it's a bit stronger. I mean, f f it's a bit stronger because uh, there is a, I will show that there is a canonical way to take this expect expectation and split it to the algebraic extensions. And and, uh, and then every and the real contribution of every proper algebraic extension, proper algebraic extension, is going to be of this form. So. And then okay, and then from here to here, it's obvious. Okay, we just take. I mean, the the thing is that the algebraic extension of minimal rank uh, are the only one we can actually see because they they give each one of them gives one over n to the to the rank minus one, and then their their error term already. Uh, Hides the contributions of the the contribution of the other algebraic extensions, and and by by hiding I mean that, I mean this is what the theorem says. I mean I'm not sure this is the reality. I mean in reality it's possible that you can actually see the you can actually see all of this and the error term is smaller. But uh, then what I it could be that the error term is smaller and then you can actually see the contribution of all the algebraic extensions. Yeah, there are finitely many, and we'll see it. Uh, we'll see it in a minute. Yeah, you will see. It. We'll actually see. It. I will now go to define the other partial order, and then uh, afterwards we'll use the other partial order to show that there are finitely many algebraic extensions. 
Yeah. Well, that they are finitely. No, no, this was not. Uh, yeah. So, for example, uh, they, they show it, but it's actually um, basically it's a it's a result of Takahashi from the 50s. He didn't call them like that, and uh, and it's also it, this is easy. The fact that they are there's a finite number, it's it's easy. Okay, so the second partial order is based on call graphs. So Stallings, Stallings call graphs. Okay, so now we fix a basis X. For FK, um, and <clears throat> okay, so I remind you that for H, for a subgroup of FK, we defined uh, we defined uh, the Schreier graph, uh, which gives the action, which describes the action of FK on the right cosets of H with respect to this generating set, x. Uh, so for example, we had our example was uh, A was the, the subgroup um, A, B, A to the minus 3, generated by A, B, A to the minus 3, and then A square B, A to the minus 2, which is a subgroup of F2 with the basis AB, and the Schreier graph looked like this. OK, and, and these are all infinite trees. OK, these, are, these go on to being infinite follower trees. And we had here. Um, I think A, A, okay, so, so this was the Schreier graph, okay, the vertices are the right cosets of H, and uh, we take a coset, we multiply from the right by A, and we get a, another coset, and this graph describes uh, what happens. Um, Okay, so this is the the Schreier graph, and the, and so now for, from here we define the call graph. So uh, the call graph of H, uh, which we denoted, which we denote by gamma of H, is uh, obtained. From the Schreier graph by omitting omitting all hanging trees. Okay, so so for example, um, here I will just omit. Okay, so another another way to put it is that I look at all the paths. All the words, all the words in my subgroup, they all they all start and end here, right? These are closed paths at this base point. But if I look only at reduced part, at, at reduced words, I don't really need this hanging tree, right? Because whenever I go into this tree, I have to come back backtracking. Uh, so if I only if I only care about reduced words, I can delete all the hanging trees and obtain something much simpler which is this. Okay, so this will be, now this is the call graph of H. Um, okay, and, and uh, <clears throat> so let me state some, uh, okay, perhaps I'll give some more, oh, I will give some more examples.
So a few more examples. So for example, if I take, so I, again, I look at subgroups of F2 for, at the moment. So the core graph of F2 looks the same as the Schreier graph because the Schreier graph has no hanging trees. Um, and here is, if I take A squared and um, B A squared, B minus one, this is going to be to look like that. So we have A, A square, and then B, A, A square, B to the minus one. This is the core graph. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm omitting some details, but um, First of all, it's obvious that, for example, here, it's obvious that you can obtain the generator of a squared and b a, uh, b a squared b minus b minus one, and therefore you can, a, and therefore you can obtain all this everything that, that is generated by these two generators. Um, and, and also, whenever you go, uh, whenever you go here. I mean, in this case, it's, it's easier, but whenever you, you go out to the right, you, it will either be this generator or it's inverse, and whenever you go to the left, it will be either, it will be some power of this one, okay? If you do, for example, several rounds and then go back, it, it will just be some power of this uh, generator. But this is a general fact. I mean, if you want to form a, if you have a generating set and you want to obtain the core graph, what you can do is take just, uh, take a base point and then take a loop, a long loop for every, so this is not one edge, this is for every generator you take this long loop with this, this joint vertices and w then you start folding, okay? So whenever you have, so if you have 2A uh, going out from the same vertex, not, not necessarily the base point, you uh, identify them. This is called the stalling folding. It's called a, fol a folding step. So you, you just uh, fold them into one edge. So if you do, the, you do this here until you run out of folding steps, that means that every vertex you have only one outgoing A, at most what, one outgoing A, at most one incoming A, etc. then you are left with a core graph. So for uh, finitely generated subgroups, it's easy to generate these core graphs. And then you need to check that you actually get exactly the uh, that if you, for example, if you are now completed by hanging trees to be a four regular graph, you get the Schreier graph. So these are things that one needs to check, but it, 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 it's not hard. Um, so here is, so this is not like the core graph, okay, because uh, this is not like the Schreier graph. There are hanging, hanging trees going out of every vertex here. And here is another example. This is the subgroup of all even length words. So it is, a, it is generated by three elements. And here if I do the same trick and I fold, eventually I get uh, this. I get this core graph. Okay, so obviously this defines me, this, this captures exactly the even length words. I have to do even number of steps to get back to the uh, yeah, me, thanks. Okay, and now, so, so these are some examples, and now I, I want to state some properties of, of core graph. Okay, so f first of all, um, age, so exactly like in the Schreier graph, in the Schreier graph we said that age is actually the labeled pi 1 of the Schreier graph. Okay, it means that I can, I, I, I just look at all the reduced paths that begin and end at the base point and I get the elements of age. So, and so because, as I said, reduced paths do not really use the hanging trees, it's the same with uh, the core graph. Sorry? Ah, because I mean that 
it's not just isomorphism. It's I actually get the exact the exact elements. I mean, if I don't only go look at the path, I also read the letters I see. So I I, I get the exact words. It's not just an isomorphism of of groups. Uh, this is of course isomorphic to the regular pi one, but. Uh, so this means that, I mean, this shows you that I can, uh, so there, this actually shows you that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, the subgroups of Fk. So this is a one-to-one -one correspondence between, between subgroups to core graphs, so to x-labeled core graphs. So I did not define what is a core graph which is not generated, I mean, but I mean, it's, it's not hard to define a core graph. It's just a, a graph with a base point such that all the edges are oriented and labeled by x1 to xk. And it has this extra property that, uh, and it has this property that there are no uh, two outgoing edges with the same label from the same vertex and no hanging trees. So if you take all these properties, you can construct a combinatorial object of a core graph. There is a, then there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the subgroup of FK and the core graphs. <coughs> and um, and now the second property is that if age is of finite rank or finitely generated. And then the core graph is finite. Okay, and this is obvious by the construction. Okay, you just take. Yes. Yeah, or you can just take the, this, this a finite set of generators, uh, construct this uh, point with uh, this flower, and then do the folding. Obviously, you get a finite graph. Um, and this shows you that if you just, uh, if you restrict to finitely generated subgroups or finite rank subgroups of FK, this is in one to one correspondence with finite um, X labeled core graphs. Yes. Core graphs, in, I mean, when I say core graphs, I mean, uh, yeah, with a base point and with an orientation to the edges. And now here's another, uh, this is an important property um, that I can, with these core graphs, I can easily see when age is a subgroup of J. Okay, and this, this happens if and only if there is a morphism of core graphs between the core graph of age and the core graph of j. Um, and in fact, in this case, uh, this morphism is unique. I mean morphism of graph. So this is just, a, it's a morphism that sends vertices to vertices, edges to edges. And it preserves everything you can think of. So it preserves the base point, it preserves the Labeling and the, the orientation. Um, no, no, not a subgraph. Oh, it can send several to the same point. Yeah, so, I get, so for example. Yeah, and the thing is that, I mean, what it, what it, um, so remember that, I mean, one way to see it, because we build the core graph from the Schreier graph. So we call that the vertices of the core graphs are just uh, uh, are just cosets, okay. And if age is a subgroup of J, then the then uh, a coset of age is always in, contained in some coset of J. So you actually send the vertex of one coset to the the coset that contains it in J. This shows you, this easily shows you that the Schreier, there is a, a map between the Schreier graphs, the corresponding Schreier graphs. And you, the only thing you need to check is that it also restricts nicely to the core graphs. Um, but again, I mean, the core graphs are just the shire graphs with the reduced words. So if you take a reduced word in age, a reduced word in age necessarily uh, is also 
age is a subgroup of J, so a reduced word in, in age is also a reduced word in J, so it has to be in the core graph of J, not in the, it, it cannot go to the hanging trees. Um, so, again, I mean, I, don't, I haven't done all the details here, but uh, just uh, trust me that there's nothing uh, surprising that happens. Okay, no. So the, the Schreier graphs are, are on to, but, but here, let, let's look at this example. So let's look at an example. So, so I'm claiming that this graph, okay, this is a subgroup generated by A square and B, A square, B to the minus one. In particular, the generators are even length. That's why it is contained in this one. And if you want to see the, so how will this, uh, morphism look like, perhaps I should draw it uh, in a different way. So I just draw it uh, like, so here I, have, I had A square, and then I had B. Yes, exactly, I map the root to the root, and then this A has to go to this A, so this vertex has to go to this vertex, and the only thing I need to to make sure is that I don't get some uh, uh, collision or, um, okay, so here I map this, two, eventually these two vertices are mapped to this one, these two vertices are mapped to me, this one, but, but as you can see, I mean, this is not onto, okay, because I have only one, for example, just one B edge, which goes to this one, so it means that this edge, Ah, no, so not, not even, no, not even vertices. It's, I mean, you can take, uh, I mean, for example, just take A square, the subgroup generated by A square. It's going to be a subgroup of this one, but the core graph is only this. So you will get, uh, no, if I take A square, yeah. So this, if I'm, this is a subgroup of this one, I can map this here but it will just be a subgraph, a proper subgraph, even of the vertices. And, but if, in, in this morphism, so you see it is not onto, okay? This B uh, is not covered by any edge. Hmm? Right, yeah. I can always add, uh, yeah, and it's very, it's, these are extremely useful if you want to prove properties of the free group. For example, uh, I know, even the easy, easy properties or, for example, that every subgroup is, con every finitely generated subgroup is contained in a finite index subgroup. Or, in, I, I mean, it's a free factor of a finite index subgroup. Or that the free group is residually finite. Many, many properties can be proven with core graphs, I mean, they become very easy if you, I mean, core graph is the right way to think of uh, free groups. Um, okay, and, and finally, I, I will go back to this morphism in a second, but, but, but finally, just another um, observation that if, so if H is a subgroup of J, but, but the morphism is injective, okay, then, Okay, so what, what is, it means that this is a subgraph of J, of, the sub, of this subgraph. Uh, so, so it means that, um, okay, so imagine this is, yes, exactly, so it will be a free FS extension, okay, because, for example, the, the white is a subgraph of the, of, the, of the whole thing, so I can take a, a spanning tree of the white one, generate a, a basis to the white group, and then I can extend the, the spanning tree to the red graph and uh, extend this basis to a basis of, uh, so in this case, H is a free factor of J. <clears throat> okay, and now, So 
So now I, I indeed want to get to, to focus on these morphisms that are onto. Okay, this will, be, this will have a special role here. And so we define now the, this, uh, par the second partial order that I promised. So if H and J are two uh, subgroups of FK, we say, we say that um, J X covers H and denote like this with X. So X is the basis. If, uh, so first of all, H is a subgroup. And since it's a subgroup, we have this morphism. So this morphism from H to J uh, with the basis corresponding to the co graphs is on two. OK, this is because, in, in some sense, if, if it is not on two, then uh, we know that age is not, it, 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 actually contain, it is actually contained in a free factor of j. OK, if, it, if it's not on two, uh, then, OK, if it's not on two, then we have here a gamma of age. There is a map to, um, gamma of j, but, the, but it actually only goes into some subgraph, if, if it's not onto. It only goes into a subgraph. And then it means that h is actually a subgroup of this subgroup. This is the subgraph corresponds to a subgroup of j. So h is actually a subgroup of a, an intermediate group, which is a free factor of j. Okay. So, give you so it, it means in particular that, yeah, so exactly. So this means that. If it is not on two, it means that H is contained in a free factor of J, a proper free factor, and that's why H is not uh, J is not an algebraic extension. Okay, so this is indeed the, so the observation is that uh, if so, in other words, if H if J is an algebraic extension of H, then J X covers H, okay. The, the, if it's an algebraic extension, then this morphism is onto because we just said that if it's not onto, then it's not an algebraic extension. This order, yes, it really depends on the. So the other one is yeah, so it's actually very interesting. What we have here is, so this shows you that this is okay. So we actually have this. If we if we look at partial orders. On let's say let's look only even only on the finitely generated subgroups of FK. So we have here this regular order, which is just injection. We have here the somewhat um, nat natural kind of natural order of algebraic extensions, and here in between we have a family, a big family of orders that depend on the basis. Okay, so this is for every for every basis of fk, we get some partial order in between. I mean, uh, and, um, and it's not clear, for example, there was an, these three guys that I, that Miasnikov, Vitur, and Weil, conjectured something very natural that the intersection of all these orders, if, if j covers age in every basi basis, then it is a right extension. But this uh, Orion myself, we find a counterexample. And uh, so this is not true. But perhaps there is some variation that is true. But uh, so it's kind of mysterious. I mean, this, this be, uh, indeed depends on the basis. But the intersection does not depend on the basis um, of all these orders. So OK. <coughs> OK, and I should say also that. Um, this is also, this is also, okay, I, I used it, but I didn't state it. This is a partial order. Okay, and this, this time it's easy to see. I mean, this time it's really, it's, it's really easy because, uh, yeah, transitive is just because onto functions are 
22. Um, and, uh, and, and, and okay, another important property because we we now only look at finite graphs and 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 uh, onto morphisms from finite graphs, uh, it shows that when I when I fix H. There are only finitely many j's that are covered, right? So another observation is that uh, if uh, age is finitely generated, then uh, there are finitely many finitely many j's. Which are covered by uh, oh yes okay and this shows you that uh, the number of algebraic extensions of age is finite and in particular. It also shows you that the critical set okay, of W, as we said, it's just a subset of the set of algebraic extensions of the subgroup generated by W. This is also finite. Um, okay, and I just want to fix something here. I mean, uh, we said that actually not J covers H, but H covers J. Uh, because the, the, the map is from H to J, not the other way around. Okay, and just, and it, it also shows you, by the way, uh, the theorem of Takahashi. The last, this one? No, I look at, uh, now age is uh, this, this subgroup. Okay, we said that critical subgroups are just algebraic extension of this group of minimal rank. Okay, this is finite, uh, even after you, you choose some specific basis, uh, this, this is finite. Yeah. Uh, possibly another uh, basis will give another bound. Okay. Right. Yes, another bound. Okay. But eventually. The base bound. Yeah, so it has to do with these uh, conjectures. I mean, for example, do you, is there some basis that gives you only the algebraic extensions, uh, for example? Uh, no, it was a, a subgroup of rank 2 in F2. But it could be that it's special to F2. I mean, it, perhaps for F3 and so on, it does. I mean, we, we use many properties of F2 in this counterexample. And, and this is just, I just want to remark that this gives you a, a theorem of Takahashi that actually shows you that if you take a finitely generated subgroup of the free group and you want to look at all the extensions, all the groups containing it, there are finitely many subgroups where you have to actually do some interesting stuff. I mean, these are the, there are finitely many extensions that are interesting algebraic, um, that is algebraic. And then you just take free extensions. So the entire picture is, is, is explained by some finite number of extensions. So he, I don't think he did it for actually algebraic extensions. He gave another proof, uh, which shows you there is some finite number. But the real fine th that for every finitely generated uh, group, subgroup of FK, there are only every, every extension of it is is, is, can be factored by finitely many subgroups. Yeah. And th so there are finitely many subgroups that, you, that you, you can extend to them, and then you just do free extensions. OK. So these were the two partial orders. Um, and now, perhaps the last thing I'll do before the break is to, to generalize uh, the entire 
to do the next thing I wanted to do after I presented the two partial orders is to um, generalize the problem to subgroups. Yeah, so it will be, I will not uh, state it in this language, but it will be uh, um, equivalent. Okay, so uh, remember what we did was to look at, we took a random homomorphism from Fk to Sn, and, and we considered the random element, so this is, a ran uh, this is random, and we considered the random element or permutation, which is just the image of W, of some word W inside the symmetric group. So now, um, instead of looking at subgroups, at, at just the image of a word, I will look at the image of a subgroup. Um, so now we take H. And, and in, uh, on purpose, I mean, I deliberately, I do not uh, use FK, but I use J here. You will soon see why. So H and J are just finitely generated free groups. And I look at a, so phi J S N will just be in homomorphism from J to S N, again, uniformly random. And we consider the random subgroup which is the image of H inside Sn. Okay, so again I can um, <coughs> So again, I can look at, uh, um, I can ask in general what kind of distribution I get on subgroups of Sn, etc. But here I, I, I will focus just on the number of fixed points. And, and what is the definition of fixed point of a subgroup? It's just common fixed point, okay? If words, um, elements between 1 to n that are fixed by all the elements of H. Yeah, I think uh, in the case of single words, it's really a fixed group and all the elements. Yeah, exactly. So if, if, uh, if I, if one is fixed by the permutation of W, it is also fixed by all the, all the powers of W, obviously. So, uh, so now we will define phi of A, J, and N uh, will be uh, so now again, I look at the image of H through a random homomorphism from J to S N, and I look at, count the number of common fixed points of this subgroup. And, <clears throat> okay, so, so in, in this language, what we had before, the expected number of fixed points of just the word, uh, This is the same in this language as phi. So my ambient group was, is Fk in this case, and uh, my subgroup is just a subgroup generated by W. Okay, this is what Avi said. Um, and <clears throat> okay, and so now I, I should say that first of all that uh, this gener generalization is crucial. Okay, we actually needed to generalize in order to to prove. And secondly, that we have the, the, the result uh, extends to this case, okay? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so this will be. Yes, I mean to three to three words that give me. Yeah. Yeah, and I can even state the result. So this will be this is the extended part, the extended uh, version of the theorem. 
Uh, okay, so, so what do you expect for a random? So if, I mean, the first thing one, this, the, the number one corresponded to uniform distribution. Uh, and uniform distribution just meant that W, it was in the case where W was primitive. And the equivalent, the parallel case here is when H is a free factor. Okay, when H is a free factor of J, then I, to generate this random homomorphism from J to SN, I can take a basis of H and extend it. So I actually get just a random homomorphism from H to SN. And then if I have a random, a random homomorphism from, a, say, a two, two rank, of, rank two uh, free group, what is the expected number of fixed points? So each point is fixed uh, with probability one over N to the rank of, to the number of generators. But I have n. Well, the minus one is coming, right? Yes. So this will be, by the theorem, this will be one over n to the rank of age minus one. So minus one is because we have n n candidates to be fixed points, and then th the rest will be the same. So we we have here n to the primitivity rank of age minus one, and the primitivity rank is ex is again the, the the smallest rank subgroup con that contain contains H bar where H is not a free factor. It's like W was not primitive, and here we had critical, the, crit, this, the number of these subgroups, and then. And this is critical for only the theorem because it's random, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Because the next, because uh, the next thing I, I will do is to, to, to do Mebius. Uh, I will look at the, so now we have a function on, on pairs of subgroups, and after the break I will do Mebius uh, inversion or derivation. Uh, so I will do it on the bigger on the bigger one on the X covers. Yeah. And uh, so after the break, we'll do the Mebius inversions, and hopefully, we'll, so <laughs> hopefully we'll prove this. Yeah. Um, so how much time? Okay, so five minutes. <laughs> five, five minutes back. <laughs> we, after, after we extended the problem to pairs of subgroups, and uh, now we can use uh, the Mebius machinery. Or I mean, it's actually just this is just a, a way to define new functions out of this phi. Um, And 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 we use here to we need to, to use this Mebius uh, to, to define this Mebius inversions of phi. We need two things. First of all, that phi will be a function on on uh, pairs of subgroups, not on not not on just uh, I don't know, anyway on pairs of subgroups. And then also we need an order which is locally finite, mean, meaning that uh, if age if H is, is smaller than J, then there are only finitely many, uh, this is just the interval between them, the, the set of, set of subgroups in between them, we want that to be uh, finite. Okay, so this is obviously not true. <laughs> if I just take this order, the regular order, there are three extensions, for example, just take the trivial group and the entire group, uh, uh, free group, obviously there are infinitely many in between, but if I take this special order, or one of them, either the algebraic extension order or, or the X cover order, then I get that this is indeed, indeed true. Okay, because I, we even we saw that for a given age, finitely generated age, there are only finitely many J's I can put here. So obviously, here I just limit it even more. Uh, so this allows us to define uh, the derivatives, or maybe it's derivatives or inversion of phi. So we have this uh, phi. So I can define actually two derivatives, one from the right, one from the left. And I can define, then I can derive it again or invert it again. This, if I, if I invert this from the right, from the left, it, it will be like inverting this from the right. And I get, and I will now, I will now define these three new functions, 
but the mysterious, it's somewhat mysterious thing that the real phenomena happen uh, in these other functions that are invert, that are derived from phi. So how do I uh, define, let's, let's start with R. So, okay, first, first of all, we look at, we actually look at phi uh, restricted to, to this partial order, okay, because we define phi for every two subgroups containing each other. Well, since it, one is containing the other, but now we restrict only to subgroups where one is, when H, X covers J. So now how, how do we define it? So for example, we say that phi H of J, okay, of N, I can, I can put the N let, later. I w I'm just going over all the intermediate subgroups, okay, in, in this partial order X covers, and I look at R H N, um, okay, and now you should tell me that I defined phi in terms of R, but because of this finiteness, this actually gives a definition by induction of R in terms of phi. It's sorry? Right, <laughs> yes. And if you want to see it straightforwardly, just if I, if I want to extract R of H and J from here, so I take R and H of J, this is just phi minus all the other other expressions of R, but all the other expressions of, of R are of, um, I mean, for all the other expressions of, of R, I look at pairs where uh, the inter interval is strictly smaller than this interval. Okay, so by, by induction on the size of this interval, um, I can say that this, is a this actually defines R in terms of phi. Um, Okay, and so I should put here n, but it doesn't really matter, okay, because uh, I can think of, because uh, these are all functions of n, but I can also, I mean, it doesn't really matter. Um, so this is how I defined R. So there was a choice here, okay, I, I took an intermediate subgroup and put it together with the smaller one, H, so I can also do it with the left hand side, with, and I now can I can fix J and go over all the intermediate ones. So this would be L. This would be the okay. So now I, fi I keep kept J and use the intermediate one uh, in the left coordinate. And now if I do it twice, I just get all the M and N such that H is a subgroup. E H X covers N, which X covers N, which X covers J, and I look at C of M and N. Okay, so this is the definition of these uh, three functions. And now, So now, somewhat mysteriously, the interesting stuff happens in, in, in this picture. So let me state the... So what are the phenomena we see? In these four functions. This is now the actual skeleton of the of the of the remaining of the proof. Um, so first of all, R is supported on a smallest uh, this, the smallest uh, smaller partial order of algebraic extensions. So this is just an easy lemma that doesn't use much that shows you that even though we we pick this uh, bigger order when we look at R. It is only supported on the smaller order. So, so it, it is zero whenever J is not an extension, an algebraic extension. And, and, and actually it also shows you that, okay, one more thing is that these functions are, are, are depend on X, okay, on depend on the basis. So phi, phi does not depend on the basis, right? 
P is just, we define it without any basis. Um, but, but after you derive it with a partial order that depends on the basis, you, you get stuff that a priori, a priori do depend on the basis. And in, indeed, L and C depend on the basis. But R, the same, I mean, the same argument shows that R does not depend on the basis. So you get here some natural function, which has, I don't have any definition for. I mean, I don't have any direct definition for. I don't, we don't understand what is the actual meaning of it, but somehow, somehow it has a interesting, very interesting properties. Is this what, what you get by putting the inverse and starting from one of the variables and dividing into the other? So it, no, it, it, will be, it will actually be the same. Oh. What we get. So you could define it like self to begin with. Uh, yeah. No, yeah, but I still would not understand exactly what it means. <laughs> I mean, okay. No, yeah, I, I can use the, I can get to this, I will get the same R if I just use the algebraic extension order. But I still, I mean, I can, the only definition is that it's in <laughs> maybe it's in version of this fee. Um, but, um, okay, but, but from this it is, um, um, with this property, uh, we show that it is, it is enough to show. Oh, okay, and, and, and in the beginning of the talk I said that I can, there is some uh, natural way to take this, the expected number of fixed points, right? And somehow split it to contributions of the different algebraic extensions. And this is given by R. Okay, so this, this Mavius derivation gives me a way to split uh, what I needed, uh, this phi, the expected number of fixed points, I actually split it to contributions from the different algebraic extensions. And, and, and therefore it is enough to show in order to prove the main theorem that um, if age is an algebraic, if j is an algebraic extension of, of age, or let's, say, let's use this, the letter n, like, like here, uh, then this function r age of n is one over n to the rank of h minus one, sorry, n. <laughs> um, okay, so this is enough to show because um, because we know that phi is this, is this expression. I go over all the algebraic extensions. Um, so I can split it to, uh, here in, in this, I have the, w one of them is age itself. So this is R of age, age plus R of N, uh, which, is, which is a proper algebraic extension, a proper algebraic extension of age, of age N. So R age and age, uh, it's the same as phi of age and age by the definition. And this gives me this, this gives me this uh, phi of age and age is, as we said, just an, a random, we get a random homomorphism from age to SN. We look at the expected number of fixed points. This is exactly, it's exactly this expression. And then for every proper algebraic extension, we get something of the order of the one over N to the, rank of this algebraic extension minus one. Um, and this gives us this, uh, and then we, we only see, because of the error term, we only see those of minimal rank, the algebraic extensions of minimal rank, which are the critical subgroups. Um, okay, so, and so this is the mysterious part that somehow the, the phenomena comes from algebraic extension. There is a, this is the real phenomena. No, not that I know of, and, and, and L depends on X. So R, R, we get that R in this derivation is, is, a, is a real function of, of the subgroups. I don't need a basis, but L is not, it's not the same for L. L, if, even if you take algebraic extensions, it, it will differ if you change the basis. Um, so, okay, so, so from now on, I mean, so now this becomes our goal, to show this for L, for R. Yeah, 
Yeah, but we said that. But then, if you if if you do this, if you do this summation here from this one, you get uh, the f the first or the one, and then here you go over all the algebraic extensions. But because of the error term, the only thing you see is those of minimal rank, and those of minimal rank are exactly the critical subgroups. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because this is rank of the minimal. Yeah, sure. Yes. Um, okay, and I will. I will. I still need to show you that R is supported on this on algebraic extensions. But this is. This is like uh, the same spirit as uh, I know a monomial uh, k variables or whatever you know at the end. At mm -hmm. As what? Sorry. Ah, why it is why supported? Is why if you, if it's not a device, if there is a free, free guy, you get self translation. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, and the second thing we'll see, we, we'll give a geometric, I hope we'll see, interpretation for phi. Okay, we'll, we'll give a, and then we'll give uh, also a geometric interpretation for L. And derive from it from this a rational expression. For L, so for given subgroups, we will be able to give a, an actual rational expression f which de defines L, and then from there we'll get the, a combinatorial interpretation. For C. And, and then from this, and we will derive from this that if uh, from this combinatorial expect interpretation, we'll derive that if M, so remember C is, uh, okay, we, we have no idea what it is right now, but after, after we do this, we see that if M is, um, Is not uh, okay. It's it's not a free factor. If we have m is a subgroup of n with in this order, but it is not n is not a free extension of m, then um, C M N will be of order. Uh, of the n to the rank of n. Um, okay, and and uh, now okay. Perhaps let's. I'll do after. I'll show you afterwards why this is enough uh, to give this. But let's. Um, It's not true for L. Yeah, it's not true for L, it's not true for C. Not so. Yeah, so I think I will skip the, because I don't have much time, I will skip the proof of this. It's, it's, it's very simple. Uh, you, you, you really don't use any of the properties of phi except for that. Uh, the, the only property you need is that if we have H and J, and J, if J is not an algebraic extension, then you have some intermediate free factor, right? And then the only thing you need is that if you look at H, at H as a subgroup of L, it is the same as looking at it as a subgroup of J, okay? Because to generate a random homomorphism of, from J to SN, just pick a basis for L, extend it to a basis of J, and then obviously, when you take a, this random homomorphism from J, when you restrict to L, you also get a random, uniformly random homomorphism, and, and then that. So H does not really see the extra generators outside of L. Um, and then things cancel out somehow in the definition. So it's really just a, a, an, an easy induction. Um, so I will skip one. So 
but let's um, so let's let's look at what is the what I call here the geometric interpretation of phi. <clears throat> so here, here is the claim. Um, if I look at the, so what is phi? Phi is just, so we know it is the expected, sorry. The, it's the expected number of uh, common fixed points, when I look at the image of age through this, run, through this random homomorphism, so I claim the following, that this is also, so now I look at core graphs. Um, so let's see, this is, this will be, this is gamma of j. This is gamma of age, and I have the, the morphism Eta, okay, because age is a subgroup of J. A and now I, I, I take here I take a random N covering. Okay, so this is a, a random N covering of gamma j. So, so what do I mean by uh, n covering? I mean, this is a, going to be a graph, not necessarily connected, but so there are the, the fiber, there's a, it, it's a covering map, topologically covering of this graph. So a, a a, above every vertex, I have n vertices. And above every edge, so if this is an edge, I have here n vertices and n vertices, there is a, some random perfect matching between this fiber and this fiber, okay? And then this is a random end covering. Yes, yeah, so I insist on labeling. I look at, uh, so oh, the, yeah. sorry? Yeah. But it's actually a cover, I mean, topologically it's a covering. The lift is an historical uh, mistake. The if, sorry, if two? Uh, no, but right now I don't. I don't look at the labels. For each of them, yes. Okay. Alternative, okay, uh, uh, and this is important. Alternatively, I can also uh, take a spanning tree here, map it just to uh, flat things here, and then just do this uh, random permutations on every remaining edge. This will be completely uh, equivalent. Okay, I will get the same. Uh, on the automorphism, I will get the same distribution here on the graphs. But I do, okay, but before that, I, I insist that um, above, the, the, above the, um, the base point, so there are n vertices, I label them 1 up to n. Okay, and then um, the claim is that, uh, okay, I, I want to lift now, now I use the word lift. I want to lift eta to, so here I have a projection P. I want to lift, et, to lift eta to, to here. So I want to map this graph, again with core graph from homomorphisms, morphism to here, such that this diagram will be commutative, okay? If I go here and then uh, project down, it's, it will be the same as eta. And the claim is that here, what I need here is the number of lifts of eta. So the number of expected number of common fixed point is the expected number of lifts of eta to this picture. And th let me explain why. I mean, so we, uh, I don't I don't really, I just need to, I don't really need the labeling. I actually need the labeling just for the proof, but uh, yeah, no, I don't care about automorphism as long as it's... Yes, automorphism often one has to design, but the number of automorphism, to me, if you just... 
I mean, there, there, are, there are several ways to define these random coverings that will give the same distribution. I mean, there are, but they, I still need this. Uh, yeah, I don't care if I have. Uh, I get each graph w with a multiplicity w w which is the same as in other. Uh, I mean, I just care about the distribution that I get eventually. So, so yeah, but but first of all, okay. So first of all, um, okay. Wh when is um, ah okay? So f first of all. Uh, there is a correspondence between actions of um, J on the set 1 to N and N coverings. N coverings of gamma of J with this labeling. So I want with such, such that the fiber above the base point is exactly is labeled by one to n. Okay, and, and to see that, okay, so actions are ju actually just actions are the same as uh, homomorphisms from J to S n. Okay, I just need every I just need to decide for every generator how it acts on one to n on one on, on one to n and. And, and this is because if you look, at, for example, at the spanning tree uh, model, so I, I fix I fix the spanning tree here, and the remaining edges somehow uh, the remaining edges uh, correspond to a basis of J. And then what I do here, I, I just the, the spanning tree I, I copy it to flat. I, I just give take a copy here, a copy here, etc. I take n copies of the spanning tree, and then each remaining edge. I just when I take a, a run, I take a random perfect matching. Okay, if this is a if this was a, a remaining edge, an edge outside the spanning tree, it will be, it will it will become a spanning a, a random perfect matching between this fiber and this fiber. So uh, so this is the the random permutation that I send this generator to. So I send this generator to this random permutation. And, and the way to read, so this is how, when given an action, I construct a covering. And, and the way back is um, if I have a covering and, and I want to know what some generator does to, what some word in J, how does a, a, a certain element of J, how does it act on 1 to n? What, what does it do, for example, to 3? So I just start at 3. I, I follow the path of my word. So remember, the word in every, every element of J is some closed path here. So I can leave this path here to, to start at 3, and I follow it. And then if it ends at 7, it means that this word takes 3 to 7. OK, so this, is the, this gives me this correspondence. Uh, and now, if I take a random, um, if I, if I check, take a random homomorphism here, which corresponds to a random Action, this corresponds to a random n covering um, of gamma of, the, of my core graph. And, <clears throat> and now I, need, I want to, uh, and now I want to um, convince you that even without the randomness, I don't need the randomness for this, um, if I have a lift so it, which corresponds to some action or some homomorph homomorphism, if I have, if I, if I have a random, uh, sorry. That if I have a cover that corresponds to some homomorphism, then the number of lifts is exactly the number of common fixed points, and this is because um, this is because when is age? When does age fixes i? Or, or when does a uh, yeah? So the image of age in J. So age is in J. J acts on one to n. When, is age, when does age fix as i? Exactly when all the words in age, if you look at the, if you look at this as a Kogoff now, and you, this is basically a Kogoff without a base point. But now you choose i 
to be the base point, and you look only at the subgroup that is corresponds to the co-graph based on in i. So now the h fixes i if and only if all the elements of h correspond to closed path at i, because it means that they take i back to i. Uh, and, and this means that gamma h, so, sorry, this is if and only if h is a subgroup of the stabilizer uh, of j, so j acts on the, 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 subgroup of, the, the subgroup of J that uh, preserves I, which is exactly the core graph, sorry, which is exactly the, the group we see when we look at the core graph of this random covering based in I. Okay, so we take this random covering based at I, and then the group we see is exactly the stabilizer of I, and this is if and only if gamma H maps the reason morphism from gamma H to uh, um, there is a, a leaf, there is a map from gamma of H to this core graph when we map the base point of, of H to I. Um, okay, so, and, and of course, uh, so, so it's, even, if it's even stronger than this, I mean, if if we have a lift, so this is actually a lift of gamma H such that the base point goes to I, this is if and only if H fixes I. Um, okay, so this shows you this, uh, this gives you a, a, this, this uh, geometric interpretation for phi. What do you mean to? To the same I? No, it cannot happen because it, it, it is, okay, these are actually labeled. I, Everything is labeled. So like, like in Kogas, you have only a, there is a unique morphism. Whenever there is a morphism, it is unique. So here again, this is everything, the picture is labeled. So if you have here an uh, A going out from the base point, there's only, there is at most one way to map it. Um, it has to go to an outgoing A that leaves I. Yeah, okay, yes. Other way to see that it has to lift eta. And uh, yeah, when you lift a connected something, it's enough to fix, uh, to, sh to, to tell where, to say where one point is going to. Um, Okay, so we gave a geometric interpretation for phi, and now, now the game will be to understand um, what is L and what is C. Um, so L is going to be, it's not going to be hard. So now somehow I need to, so I have this interpretation for phi, I know that uh, it counts the number of lifts, and now I somehow need to split phi into different proper, uh, into different intermediate subgroups. So wh where do I see intermediate subgroups between H and J in this picture? So, so this is exactly um, this stabilizer. Uh, sorry, not the stabilizer, the, um, the image of gamma of H here. Okay, so if gamma of H, the, if there is a lift, say, to I, Okay, so I, I can look at the image. So there is, let's say that this is the image of gamma of H. So this, the image corresponds to some subgroup of, of the free group, uh, which is covered by H. It, H X covers it because there is an, an onto morphism. And this also, uh, it's easy to see that this also covers J. It has to cover J because this map is onto, so this map also has to be onto. Okay, so the next claim is that we can give a geometric interpretation for L. So L So now I have the same picture. This is gamma of H. This is gamma of J. 
This is a random end covering. Okay, but now instead of just counting lifts, I, I, I'm saying that each lift I, ca I can, okay, again, so I, I have a lift from here to here. Um, and if I, I want to understand, I want to uh, contribute to attribute it to some intermediate subgroup, and this subgroup will be exactly uh, the image of gamma of H. Um, okay, so in other words, um, so now it will not be, so it means that if I want to, to understand what M, L of M and J here, it will be exactly the copies of gamma of M here. Okay, it will be the number of copies I see of M, of, of the core graph of M inside here, because whenever I have a gamma of M here, I can lift gamma of H uh, to, to this place. So I, I just did copies of M. It will be the number of injective Okay, so uh, it's probably a bit. Uh, sorry, I look at. All? Ah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Here, here, whenever I have a map here, the image has to be some quotient of H. So I just, I just uh, divide these lifts by which quotient I see. And this will be the, the same division I have when I derive phi to L. So H of J, I, I go over all, this is, L is just going over all the intermediate ones, M. But the quotient here has to be something intermediate. So be, because, somehow, because I get, I can, be, because I can split this, this function in a canonical way to intermediate subgroups, it gives me L. It has to give me L. I mean, there are no two different derivations. So L has, L has to be this function. Okay, and, and now the next thing is that I, I claim that from here, from this claim, I can get a, a rational expression for L. Okay, Bec now, now I know that what is L. I know that L counts injective lifts. So, so let's, let, let's see what... If, how we can get the a rational expression for the number of injective lifts from this co to a random covering of this co of n? Yes, again. Yes, as a function of n. So the, it's the same... Yeah, so the, a, random, a random homomorphism is the same as a random covering. It's a random covering, so, and actually this theorem, you can read more of the expectation for foreign lifts. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. yes, right. It's actually a statement about specific, the number of right. foreign lifts you see. Yeah, I can delete the expectation and it will still be true. But now for L, and this is also true. Mm -hmm. uh, L is also without expectation. This is a, uh, uh, no, okay, it's not L, but. Okay, this term without, this is without, also true without the expectations, but now in the, in the rational expression, I, I will use the expectation. The fact that there is randomness. So, so now I need to understand, say I have this, um, okay, let's look at, uh, at an example. Let's say that, uh, let's say I look at this, this is the co-graph of the commutator word, A, B, A minus 1, B minus 1. Yes, yes. So this is a, this is a generalization of Nika's uh, argument. The, what I'm going to say now, the rational expression. Um, so if this is my sub, this is my, okay, this is my the core of the of some the subgroup generated by the commutator word, and this covers, for example. Um, so we have this graph. Okay, just, you can just see that this, the commutator belongs to this subgroup. Okay, I do A, B, A inverse, B inverse. Okay, and I return here. Uh, so this is the covering. 
And now I want to understand how many lifts I have of this one into a random end covering of this graph. Um, so first of all, so first of all, let's take. Um, so we know that th these two vertices, there are two vertices here, that are mapped to this vertex. So I will just pick random two. I will just I just need to pick two vertices in this fiber that to map these ones into. Okay, so first, first I want to count how many injective lifts I have only of, only of the vertices. So this gives me, um, for these two, I, I, let's say I take one, there's n options for this one, and then n minus one options for this one. And then for the, these two are mapped into this fiber. So there are, there's another n times n minus one. And now, um, and now let's see, now this, this is, remember when I, do a random, when I do a random covering, I can take every edge into a random permutation. So what are my, after I pick these two elements, I, I need this random permutation to map this vertex to this one. So I have a, one constraint on this permutation. Therefore, the and the probability that the random permutation uh, respects this constraint is exactly one over n. And now for this, for this one, I, I already have, there are two edges mapping, mapping to this edge. So I have actually, after choosing the vertices, if I pick these two and these two, and let's say I, I have, so I have this constraint and this constraint. So now I have two constraints. So the a random permutation satisfies two constraints with probability one over n times n minus one. And then again, for this permutation, I have another n. Okay, so if you do this uh, in general, the expression you get is that L of mj. So what we actually do is to go over all the vertices in j. So we go over all v in the, the vertices of j. V of j is just the vertices in the co-graph of j. And we had here n times n minus 1 up to n minus <clears throat> this is just the number of vertices in H that, map, that are mapped to V. N? E M is eta. We have, this, is, this is eta. And for each vertex, so for, for example, for this vertex, I, I know that there are two vertices map, mapped, mapping to this one that are mapped to this one. Therefore, uh, I need n minus, I go up to, from n and to up to n minus 2 plus 1. Okay, and then I divide. This is the number of injective lifts of the vertices. And now again, for each edge here, I count how many edges are mapped to it. And this gives me the number of constraints I have on the permutation. So it would be, now we go over all the edges of, of j. And again, I have the same expression. Which depends on the number of pre-images for eta of this edge. Okay, this gives me the rational expression of, of L. And uh, when I, if, I, if I would take here just F2, it would be exactly Nika's. Nika's argument is exactly when this graph is F2, just the bouquet with, uh, or, or a bou in general, just a bouquet, fk, and this is a single word. This is, I would get here exactly Nika's uh, expression. Okay. Sorry, if you, if I? Ah. Ah, right, but before I did that, I, 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 the first stage was to look at the patterns. So I said that if I have a commutator, I look at the different patterns. Uh, I said that f oh, if, one is a f if I is a fixed point of the commutator, um, yes, exactly. Yeah, it, when, I when I say which one, so this is A, B, A inverse, B inverse, so when I choose which one of J, K, L, and I are the same, and which are different, it's the same as 
uh, going over these M's. Yeah, it's, it's, it's moving from phi to L. <coughs> okay, so, so now we relatively understand L well, and we also have a rational expression, so we, we can actually compute all of these functions. Okay, we have a rational expression for L and therefore for phi and R and C. And now the, the perhaps the, the obstacle that was hardest to uh, understand, to, to solve here, was moving, going from L to C. Okay, so we have a, a good understanding of L, and, and, and somehow I think at this point we already understood that we should somehow take this expression for L and, and derive it. And, 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 and somehow we, it wasn't like very clear, but we had this understanding that we should somehow derive it into C. So in some, in some way, we should take this, exp this um, expression that corresponds to two subgroups and somehow, again, take it and split it to different contributions by intermediate, by intermediate subgroups between M and J. And so this was... Uh, <coughs> So this was somehow, this was uh, the obstacle that took the most time to bypass. And and eventually, this is what, this is the solution to this. So uh, now we get a combinatorial interpretation. for C, for the two-side two derivation of uh, phi. And, uh, and, and uh, one thing you want to notice is that there is a, a formula from uh, the, the theory of Stirling numbers um, that gives you a, a different way to write these uh, falling factorials. So let, let's denote it by n to, n to the r is just n times n minus 1 up to n minus r plus 1. It's the falling factorial of n with r elements. Um, so it turns out that this is the same as n to the r. And then going, you can go over all the permutations in sr, take the sine of sigma times 1 over n to the n to the norm of sigma, and this is just, the norm of sigma is just the number of trans transpositions, transpositions needed to generate a sigma. So for example, if, if r equals 4, n, n minus 1, n minus 2, n minus th th 3, so what you get here is uh, n to the 4 and then 1 uh, minus <coughs> 6 over n plus 11 over n squared minus 6 over n to the 3rd. So this is what you get. And you can see that this corresponds, this is, this corresponds to the identity permutation. Yeah, these are all the permutations that are generated by one transposition. So these are permutations of this kind, and there are indeed six of them. These are permutations, there are 11 permutations in S4 that are generated by two, by two, uh, two transpositions. Yes, yeah. and these are t these two conjugacy classes. So we have three of those and eight of those. And here we have the full cycles. They are generated by three elements. Um, <coughs> Okay, so, um, okay, actually, I don't want to hide it. Okay, so we had this expression. So now there is a way to, I mean, uh, to simplify things. I want to uh, make this as simple as possible. So we can assume, I mean, I just want to show you the proof when the numerator. Ah. 
I know. I mean, uh, these numbers, when, when you these numbers, the six, eleven, six are called Sterling numbers of some kind. Yeah. And uh, so it's a. Uh, you know how to prove it? Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't remember at the moment. I mean, but it appears in in Van in uh, Lint and uh, Van. Uh, yes, it appears there, for example. Uh, yeah, but I th perhaps even uh, at lunch I would I would <laughs> I would tell you how to prove it when I I try to remember. Um, okay. It should be some kind of trace of fixed points on the permutation group with some identity like that uh, along the line. It looks very familiar. Yeah, it's also very convincing, right? One example here <laughs> is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can't write something like that down. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, but, um, <clears throat> okay, so now to, to, to go on, I, I just want to uh, explain what happens I, even if the numerator is very simple. It just, just let, let's say that, so in order to make the, 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 uh, denom sorry, the denominator simple, I will assume for now that every, uh, that this is always n. So in other words, the pre-image of every edge here is just one edge. Okay, but, but we can, Okay, the proof is uh, good for everything, for the entire picture. So assume uh, the pre-image of E is just one for every um, E, for every edge of the cograph of J, and then, so now what is L of M? Uh, L of M and J, Uh, okay, so the denominator gives me one over n to the number of edges of edge. Sorry. Um, yeah, it's actually just the number of. Okay, it could be that there are edges here where the, the pre-image is empty. Okay, so what I really get here is the number of edges here. Okay, each one of them is mapped into a into a unique edge. E each edge here is the only edge that mapped into the, its image. So here what I really get is the number of edges of M. And then, and here for every vertex I get, uh, so here I get, I go over all the vertices of J, and now I get this expression, this one, so it is N to the number to R. R here is the number of pre-images of V times I go over all the permutation of S on the pre-image of V. So I take permutations in on the vertices of, of M that are mapped to V and I get sine of sigma and 1 over N to the um, <coughs> norm of sigma, but now I, I, I now I want to, to unite these expressions. Okay, so this so I have a permutation on these two vertices and a permutation on these two vertices. But in fact, I can look at it as a permutation of these entire vertices that uh, respects the the map that does not uh, confuse different fibers. Okay, so so now I want to look at this as no, instead of a permutation of these two vertices and these two vertices, it will be a permutation of the entire four vertices, but which respects eta, okay? It does not mix vertices from different fibers. So what I get here, uh, okay, and this I can also, this thing is also, I just, it's n to the number of fibers, all different fibers, when I add them up, I get n to the total number of vertices in M, and here I have minus the number of edges in M. And now I go over all the permutations over the vertices of M that respects respects eta. And all of these, the sign and the norm in these cases are all multi multi uh, multiplicative. I mean, 
the, the norm is an uh, additive because these are permutations are actually on different chunks of the of the numbers. So I get here sine of, of sigma times one over n. Okay, so I get the same thing. And now, um, so I should still tell you the secret. What what, what j is, what uh, c is. Um, so, so for this, I made this picture here, which I. <laughs> okay, so now I, I have this picture. This is the this is the graph I want to I, I want to look at the L of this graph and this graph. Okay, so so what I have is a, a permutation on these four vertices. In this case, it doesn't have to preserve anything. Okay, it, it uh, I mean the permutation on the vertices. I can, they're all mapped to the same vertex, so there are, there are no limitations. And now I somehow want to, so uh, to take this expression and, and split it to contributions from different uh, subgroups in between. In this case, these are the subgroups in between. There are, there are five intermediate, proper intermediate subgroups. And the way to do it is, for example, let's say this is one, two, three, and four. So let's take, for example, the permutation one, two. So the way to look at it is to take one and two and, and uh, identify them. And then I get, uh, this is one and two. This would be A. Um, and now I have B, B, and A. But I want to get a core graph. OK, this is not a core graph because I have two outgoing Bs, so I have to fold. So from this, I get, I, I have to identify these two Bs, so I will get this graph, okay, with B, A, and A, which is this one. Okay, so this permutation corresponds to this one, etc. So I, I will denote it by uh, saying that, so in each case, I get some intermediate, uh, okay, I get some, obviously, I get. I, I just do, I, I identify vertices according to permutation and then I fold. Obviously, I get something, a, a subgroup that is covered by this subgroup, right? I just folded. I got a quotient. So I, now I rewrite this as going over all uh, Yes. Yeah, this is this equals okay. This is uh, and let's let's write it like this. So the rank of m is uh, e minus v plus one. So this is the rank of h of m minus one. Um, yeah, okay. So let's write it. So this is one over n to the rank of m minus one, and now. I go over all, okay, I don't have enough space here. Um, okay, I'll write it here. Oh. Okay, we're very close to the end. So now this is one over n to the rank of m minus one. And now I, I, so again, I gather these permutations according to the subgroup I get when I define, when I um, identify only uh, vertices that are in the same fiber. So I go over all. These are always subgroups inside the interval MJ. And then I go over all the permutations of S. Uh, v of m, such that when I take the core of m and do this identification by sigma and fold, I get the core of n. And then this is a sign of sigma times 1 over n. OK, and again, because I somehow managed to do this, uh, to, to take L and divide it to different contributions in a canonical way, it, it is easy to, see. it is not hard to see from this that this has to be C. Okay. So 
Okay, this has to be the, val the, the, the function c. Um, so this gives you the, and, and now I need two more minutes to, to end, to finish. Because uh, there's another very beautiful point here. Okay, so, okay, so what? what? What do I do with it? Uh, the thing is that now a corollary, from this expression I can easily deduce something very uh, important about C. If M is not a free factor of N, then uh, C M N is of order of magnitude at least, at most, N to the rank of N. Okay, so, so if this is not a free factor, I, I have some upper bound on C. And why is that? This is because, l l w w what is, w where do I get, so this is a rational expression. C is a rational expression. Where do I get these, uh, okay, actually C is also this one, okay. <coughs> this, of course, also belongs to C. No, no, but the first, I, here I go over only sigmas that generate, that from M generate N. Okay, so it's not the identity. The identity is only valid for when M is equals N. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, but how could you have uh, the norm of sigma? Because if you want the norm of sigma to be zero, uh, No, but you get the rank of N of, the, of this. One, one. Rank of N. You want one. You want one. No, no, no. I want, no, no, no. This is M. This is n, n. Okay, so I got this is n. So where do I get this? So there, are n, n to some uh, power appears here twice. So I, I always have this n to the rank of m minus one, and then I get this extra power, this extra power of n. Uh, but the thing is that if m, okay, the thing is this. The, the important thing is this: that whenever I identify two elements, it's the same as taking this group and adding a generator. Okay, if I identify these two elements, it's like adding A to, to this group as a generator. And I get a, a bigger group. So whenever I identify, so if I identify three pairs of elements, I added three generators. So now the thing is that if the, um, if M is not a free factor of N, it means that I need to add, I need to add more than rank n minus rank m generators. Generators to m. Okay, if I, if I can, it's actually if and only if, I mean, if, if I can add exactly this number of generators, then I can just take a basis and this will be an extension of that. It will show you that m is a free factor of n, but it's not, so I need to add more than this number of generators. So this shows you that this, every sigma that takes me from m to n, has to be at least of, it has to be more, than the, the norm of it should be more than that. So I get here rank of m minus one, plus something that is bigger than rank of n minus rank of m, so it is at least rank of n. Um, okay, and then, f and so finally, and then from here, just to uh, close up, and then remember I, I had this r, now I have r. I need to show that R uh, of age and N, when age is an algebraic extension, is, some, is in, of the order of R 1 to the rank of N minus 1. I need to show this, but what is R? This is the same as going over all C, or over all M. of C, M, N. Um, <clears throat> so there is, one, there is one special, if I take M equals N, I can take M equals N, so this is C of N and, and N, and then the remaining ones are those that are strictly less than N. So, so this gives me, C of N and N is the same as phi of N and N. I mean, this, is, this gives me 1 over n to the rank of n minus 1. This gives me this expression. And all of this, because it was an algebraic extension, I know that n, um, 
sorry, it's not, uh, yes. Yeah, because n is an algebraic extension of h, I know that there is no intermediate proper free factor. So h, this is not a free extension. So I can apply this theorem and see that this is O of rank one of rank one of rank of n. So this all goes into here. So this is uh, the proof. <laughs>